unabashed. The most unpredictable becomes a headline. The most volatile outrageous behavior. Unsubstantiated narratives. A battle of personalities. Welcome to Grand Tamasha, a co-production of the Carnegie Endowment for International Peace and the Hindustan Times. I'm your host, Milan Vaishnav. This week, Indian Prime Minister Narendra Modi arrives in Washington for his first in-person meeting here with U.S. President Joe Biden. Modi, Biden, and the leaders of Australia and Japan will also be gathering for an in-person edition of the Quad Leader Summit. To understand what's on the agenda and what it means for the United States and for India, I'm joined today by my colleague, Ashley J. Tellis. Ashley holds a Tata Chair for Strategic Affairs and is a senior fellow at Carnegie, but perhaps most importantly for the purposes of the show, he is one of Grant Thamash's most popular guests of all time. I'm very happy to welcome him back to the show. Ashley, thanks for taking the time. Thank you so much, Milan, for having me. I'm delighted to be back. So since you were last on the show, we have had not one, but in fact, several systemic shocks to the global system. We've had the onslaught of the Delta variant, first in India, now in the United States, the election, of course, of a new American president, and the recent U.S. withdrawal from Afghanistan. Let me start by asking you about the last one first. If you could just sort of describe for us what the Taliban takeover in Kabul means for India. I think there's no way to put a gloss on what is a very unfortunate outcome from India's perspective. Uh, The U.S. withdrawal from Afghanistan and the Taliban takeover really represent uh, a reversal for India along multiple dimensions. Uh, India had hoped uh, that the U.S. mission in Afghanistan would have been successful and that it would have been able to extinguish the sources of jihadism uh, that were operating in that region and that the U.S. essentially confronted for 20 years. Uh, We have left with that job unfinished. And that has clear consequences for Indian security. There is another dimension that is important to recognize. India made big investments uh, in Afghanistan over the last 20 years, economic and security. And those investments were made because India wanted to preserve an Afghanistan that was free of Pakistani influence. That objective, too, uh, has failed. And now, uh, I think India is beginning to confront a new reality that was only in its peripheral vision over the last 20 years. And that is its most threatening adversary, China, now has ended up with a larger-than-life role Uh, in Afghanistan. And so when India looks at Afghanistan today and sees the combination of these factors, uh, of which the last, China's new role, is perhaps the most unsettling, uh, there's no way that Indian security elites can conclude uh, anything other than uh, accepting that India's security has taken taken a big hit. So as you look ahead, what is Delhi's posture likely to be vis-a-vis the Taliban regime? Because in some sense, you know, the Indian government is leading the charge globally against recognizing the regime. Yet, of course, there are very practical concerns about refugees, about the humanitarian crisis, obviously questions of of cross-border terrorism. So how is it going to balance these competing factors? So this is a challenge that, you know, will occupy Indian policymakers for at least the next few months until there is clarity about how the global uh, system uh, responds to this new Taliban regime uh, in Afghanistan. My suspicion is that they are going to be very pragmatic about it and they're going to walk a tightrope. And what is the pragmatism and what is the tightrope of take? The pragmatism uh, involves keeping some lines of communication open uh, to the Taliban leadership, uh, particularly through the Doha connection. Because as you point out correctly, there are still, you know, thousands of Indians in Afghanistan. Uh, The whole future of India's development projects uh, are still an open question and so on and so forth. But I think India wants to make certain that there is no rush to recognition and no rush to financial assistance. Of course, some assistance has to be provided on humanitarian grounds, but uh, India does not want the international spigot opened until it receives clear assurances from the new regime in Kabul that India's equities will be protected, 
And what what does that mean? I think it means three things. Uh, first, that there will be no threat uh, to the to to Indian lives, uh, both uh, the non official personnel that are present as well as the official presence when it returns. Uh, that's the first assurance India would like. Uh, two, India would want to make certain that uh, the uh, regime commits to not permitting Afghan territories to be used as a springboard uh, for attacks against India. And third, I think India will want to find ways of ensuring that whatever cleavages exist between the Taliban and Pakistan, those cleavages actually expand rather than diminish. Uh, you know, this is a this is a, a hard uh, this is a hard challenge to to overcome. But I think India is going to be cautious in what it does, and is going to is going to approach these with a certain measure of delicacy. Let me steer this conversation to the U.S. India relationship because there have been several commentators in India who have sounded a note of betrayal uh, in the op-ed pages. Right? They are basically saying, "Look." The United States has hung Delhi out to dry by rapidly drawing down in Afghanistan. It has left this problem child on Delhi's doorstep. You know, as you look out at the scene, how do you think the events of the past month, right, the last 30 days, have affected how Delhi views the bilateral partnership? So let me make two points there, Milan. I mean, first, in purely objective terms, uh, we cannot deny that the U.S. exit has had unfortunate, unintended consequences for India security. Uh, to that degree, I think many of the Indian complaints are right. But we have to emphasize the word unintended because, you know, this was not done with a with malice of forethought. This was not done with the intention of making India's life more difficult. Uh, rather, everyone knew that U.S. policy was evolving in a certain direction, that the U.S. was going to leave Afghanistan sooner or later. And of course, we wish the circumstances of the exit had been different. Uh, but what has happened has happened. And I actually sense a remarkable degree of sophistication on the part of the government of India. The government of India appreciates that uh, this exit was inevitable. Uh, they are simply now looking to work with the United States in mitigating the long-term consequences of that decision. Mm -hmm. And so while unofficial India is exercised about the United States, I think the government has been not only more restrained, which of course it has, but also been more sophisticated in its appreciation of what needs to be done. And so the conversations that have taken place, and there have been several conversations at the highest levels in the last in the last several weeks, have really been focused on what do we need to now do together to mitigate the ill effects? What, what kind of cooperation between the two countries is still possible? And let's work together to develop a roadmap uh, that allows both countries to get to where they want to go. And, and correct me if I'm wrong, but I have not seen any Indian official publicly criticize the United States move. They, now, privately, they may grumble, but the official government stance uh, has not been uh, to cast aspersions on the U.S. withdrawal. That is absolutely correct. And I think it's partly because there was no strategic surprise, right? There was a tactical surprise in the way that the president pushed this, uh, you know, in the manner that it all came out. But strategically, ever since the Trump administration, India recognized that the U.S. was on its way out and therefore had to, you know, devise some alternative or backup plans of its own. So in that sense, uh, you know, this is uh, this is not shocking, uh, at least with respect to the broad outcome. So we're speaking here uh, just several days away from the prime minister's first in-person visit with President Biden here in Washington, D.C., Obviously, without a doubt, Afghanistan is going to be one of the most pressing agenda items. Uh, I'm going to ask you after this to, to elaborate on, on the Quad Summit, what might happen. But if you leave those two issues aside, what do you think are the other key discussion points for the bilateral visit between Modi and Biden? Well, I suspect, uh, you know, there is going to be a long agenda because the bilateral relationship has really uh, dramatically expanded. Uh, in the in the last several years, uh, I expect that China 
and the future of the Indo-Pacific will be an important element of discussion. Uh, Clearly, there's a quad dimension to that, and we will see that conversation in the quad. But even in the bilateral U.S.-India relationship, there are issues of defense cooperation. Uh, There are issues of what the two countries can do with respect to intelligence sharing and so on and so forth that, you know, that are connected to China. So I expect that will be uh, that will be important. The COVID pandemic has not been defeated uh, in either country. And India has uh, is seen in the United States as a very important partner in the global vaccine campaign. And so I expect that, you know, some discussion about when India can resume making vaccine contributions to the global effort uh, will be will be on the agenda as well. Uh, this administration, uh, you know, in a sharp departure, obviously, from Trump's policy, has reaffirmed its commitments to climate change and climate mitigation. And I think there will be some serious conversations. We've had Secretary Kerry already go to India twice. There will be some serious conversations about, uh, you know, what India proposes to do with respect to its own national commitments, uh, particularly in the ramp up to uh, to the Glasgow summit. Uh, I expect that there will be other conversations with respect to civilian space uh, as well as to military space. Uh, we've begun those we've begun those uh, discussions already. Uh, the challenges of cyber security which again matter heavily to the United States and India, I expect will be on the agenda. And of course, that, you know, hardy perennial of the last two years, which is supply chain diversification, uh, where India has big asks. And I think the U.S. is willing to be supportive. But sometimes India's own domestic economic policies subvert that ambition. So there is a huge agenda, uh, I think, uh, in the bilateral conversation. And we will, you know, we will see the the joint statements that lay that out, I think, quite copious. You know, Beijing has already been quite vocal and quite critical of this uh, quad leader summit, right? They've, it's criticized this meeting for creating further tension in the region, for provoking enmity between nations. Six months ago, the quad leaders committed to a sort of three point action plan, right? Cooperating on vaccines, which you mentioned, uh, developing solutions to the climate crisis but also putting together kind of smart minds on all four sides to think through a common approaches to critical and emerging technologies. Uh, six months isn't a long time, but can you sort of give us a report card as it were? Is have we, have we achieved anything thus far in the sort of, you know, uh, last six months of this, this, this three point plan? You know, it's very hard to judge that from the outside. My own sense is that the achievements uh, will actually be quite modest. Uh, We will have probably made the biggest gains with respect to the issues of technology and diversification. Uh, The issues of vaccines at this stage really hinge very much on the challenges India faces at home and when it can overcome them uh, in order to, to make the contributions that we just discussed about. But I think that, you know, focusing on those three pillars can miss what I think is the bigger issue. And the bigger issue is that the Quad has not only survived, I think it has become a highly durable part of the uh, Indo-Pacific architecture. And it repudiates uh, the Chinese claim early on that, you know, this effort would dissipate like ocean foam, right? The fact that uh, they have met, the four leaders have met virtually, are now meeting, uh, you know, in person and will have commitments to meet again in person shows that this is a group of countries that is committed to maintaining the balances against China. And I Take that to be actually the most important element, uh, you know, of these of these discussions uh, in the in in the next few days. There's another country which has been nervous, shall we say, about next week's gathering. And that's Pakistan, and there are many people, as you know, uh, you've been a part of these conversations, who are speculating about what the future of the U.S. Pakistan relationship might hold. Right, because on the one hand, there are people who firmly believe the United States no longer has to cozy up to the Pakistani government because our troops are out of Afghanistan. So the leverage that they may have had over us has diminished. 
However, there are some on the other side who say the exact opposite, that uh, going forward, uh, Pakistani cooperation is going to be vital if the U.S. is to have any over-the-horizon capacity to address what I think are very real uh, counterterrorism challenges in the region. On which side of this debate do you sort of come down? You know, how do you think about these two competing uh, claims? I mean, I don't think there's any doubt uh, that Pakistan once again has enjoyed elevated importance, uh, precisely because uh, if we are going to stay in the counterterrorism business in Afghanistan, sheer geography is going to make uh, Pakistan important. But the expectation that this will somehow lead to a return to the U.S.-Pakistan relationship of the kind that we enjoyed in the Bush and Obama years, I think that is completely that is completely mistaken. Uh, that kind of a relationship is simply not going to return. And the United States is going to be very careful about what it does with Pakistan and ensure that whatever it does with Pakistan does not undermine the fundamental importance of the bilateral relationship with India. And it's very telling to me that when a Pakistan's national security advisor, Mohd Yusuf, for example, came to Washington several weeks ago, uh, he could not, uh, you know, he did not go back having achieved the two objectives that he came here for. One was to engineer a conversation between President uh, Biden and Prime Minister Imran Khan. That has not occurred. And two, try to convince the, uh, you know, American strategic elite and the U.S. government that Pakistan is once again now in an axial position and therefore deserves special treatment. Uh, both those objectives are frustrated, and I think that is a very telling sign of where the U.S.-Pakistan relationship will go. Do you think on the first point that's a mistake, Ashley? Because, you know, some people say, look, like it or not, Pakistan is a nuclear-armed nation. So uh, not having a, a head of state call between Imran Khan and, and President Biden isn't actually going to do any good because we have, at the end of the day, real security interests. So do you think this sort of stalemate, as it were, is sustainable? I don't think so. I mean, I, you know, I, I'm not particularly upset by the fact that President Biden chose not to call. Uh, other than the, you know, symbolic proprieties, uh, the real question is, what would the president speak to Prime Minister Imran Khan about? I mean, it is so obvious to all those who have looked at Pakistan closely that Prime Minister Imran Khan does not determine the destinies of Pakistan, either as a state or as a nation. Uh, the forces that determine Pakistan's destinies are behind the scenes. And it would be simply inappropriate uh, for the president to be engaging the real power brokers in Pakistan at this juncture. And so I think he made the best call. Now, it, this doesn't mean that we haven't, you know, connected with Pakistan at various other levels, right? Uh, that engagement continues. But I think the president has made the right call. So I'd like to come back to, to the China question for a second, because this past summer, you and Evan Medeiros uh, co-wrote a piece in Foreign Affairs that I think is well worth people reading, and we'll link to that, called Regime Change is Not an Option in China. And just to summarize the argument very briefly, you basically say, look, the U.S. strategy towards China has to focus on Beijing's behavior rather than its leadership. And I'm wondering if you could help tell us, how do you kind of analytically separate the two? Well, I think the piece was provoked in large measure by what we saw occurring in the last couple of years of the Trump administration, uh, where the United States went out of its way uh, to uh, identify the Communist Party of China as the root cause of, you know, all Chinese evils. Now, I have no difficulty accepting that thesis, that the Communist Party of China is, in fact, a highly distasteful entity. It is a repressive uh, you know, it leads a repressive regime that is the source of many of China's evils. But I don't see targeting the regime as being either productive for the United States or particularly efficacious. To, to our minds, the point really is to focus on Chinese behavior. And we were of the view that even if the Communist Party of China was not in charge, there is every likelihood 
that a rising China, even if led by a different kind of leadership, could be just as assertive and just as aggressive in a way that we've seen China be. And so our emphasis was really to keep the focus on Chinese behavior rather than the character of the Chinese regime. And I hope, uh, you know, the, the Biden administration does that. So far, they seem to be doing that, focusing on behavior rather than on regime, uh, on the regime itself. And I think that's really the way to go. Ashley, in the wake of the Afghanistan withdrawal, you know, a refrain that we are starting to hear again, it's not a new one, but we're, we're hearing it maybe uh, more intensely uh, from Delhi, is that America is still thinking about this Indo-Pacific construct as something that relates to what happens to India's east, while Delhi is imagining a much wider area of operation, which includes India's west, stretching all the way you know, to the east coast of Africa. Do you think that in this administration, we are seeing any signs or any evidence that the American view on this has evolved? And are, are we seeing any kind of greater convergence in, 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 in this view? Well, I think... The U.S. always had the view that the Indo-Pacific extended all the way uh, to the to the east coast of Africa. In fact, even in the Trump years, you know, there were references made to that geography. Uh, and in recent times, uh, you've had Secretary Austin come out and say that quite clearly that we see the Indo-Pacific not simply at you know beginning at the Straits of Malacca, but going much further. But having said all that, I mean, I think we have to admit that there is a difference in emphasis. And that difference in emphasis, in my view, is rooted in the differences in interests. For the United States, the biggest threats in the Indo-Pacific region really are manifested east of the Straits of Malacca. Whereas for India, the biggest threats in the Indo-Pacific region are those that materialize west of the Straits of Malacca. Now, there's no way we can abridge, uh, you know, this reality. And so, to my mind, the challenge is that both have to be sensitive to where the burdens of threat lie, and both have to find ways uh, to reassure the other that they recognize the challenges and are working collaboratively to meet them. Uh, but I don't, I don't want to minimize the fact that there is a difference in emphasis, uh, both in New Delhi and, and in Washington. I don't see that going away anytime soon. Let me ask you about a, 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 another criticism that you sometimes hear, which is, OK, let's, let's take the Biden administration face value, that they do have a renewed focus on the Indo-Pacific, however described. But at the end of the day, uh, you simply don't have the personnel in place to make it happen. Uh, you don't have an ambassador in India. You don't have an ambassador in China. You you only recently uh, got, got a, a confirmed an assistant secretary of state for South and Central Asia. Um, as somebody who has worked in the mission in Delhi, as someone who's worked in the United States government, uh, to what extent is this lack of personnel because of our own political bureaucratic machinations an actual problem when it comes to implementing this president's vision? I think it is a very serious handicap. I, you know, you cannot say this, uh, you cannot say this strongly enough. It is a very serious handicap. And especially not having an ambassador in Delhi, uh, since most of the delicate interactions always take place face to face, uh, I think really is going to undermine many of the things that this administration wants to do. Now, of course, you know, the United States is a great power. We have other means of communication. The personal relationship between the president and the prime minister is one such. Uh, the very good relationship that uh, Secretary of State Blinken enjoys with uh, External Affairs Minister Jai Shankar is another. But as practical matter, if you want to get things done, you have to be fully staffed, both in D.C. and in Delhi. And the honest truth is that we're not fully staffed, at least for the moment, in Delhi. And until a few days ago, we were not staffed, even in Washington. And, uh, you know, so uh, Assistant Secretary Liu will have his work cut out for him. Uh, he has a very good team. He has a very good team. Uh, but 
you know, he does need a counterpart uh, in, 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 in New Delhi. And I really hope that, you know, our own politics will allow, you know, Ambassador-designate Garcetti to go there sooner rather than later. Let me conclude this conversation by asking you about the prospects for the future, right? I think you and I, and most people who listen to this program, uh, uh, would agree that regardless of whatever current turbulence the relationship might be experiencing because of recent events, the strategic logic of U.S.-India relations still appears pretty robust, right? But there are a number of people uh, in both countries who are questioning the economic and or political logics, right? We see a turn to protectionism in India. Uh, we see inequality here in the United States, and, and that has uh, political and economic policy ramifications. And we see, of course, uh, the common democratic struggles in, in, in both countries, right, in India and in the United States. As someone who has uh, implemented this relationship, uh, studied this relationship, guided this relationship for so long, how do you react to some of the skeptics who say that, you know, if you think about this relationship as having these multiple pillars, um, several of them now are uh, decaying or deteriorating? So I take the deterioration and the threats of deterioration seriously, because I think if we want to have a truly fecund relationship, you know, we've got to be firing an all cylinder. Uh, if the economic uh, leg is weak, if the leg about democratic solidarity is weak, then I think we are left with one single pillar, and that single pillar is essentially strategic convergence. Now, I hope the strategic convergence proves to be robust enough that it creates space for us to creatively you know, and thoughtfully uh, address our differences in the other areas. I hope that is the case. But it constantly worries me precisely because, you know, we are two complex democracies, two complex societies, uh, with each of us with our own sort of sensitivities about how, how we deal with China. It really becomes important that, uh, you know, we put these other pieces or keep these other pieces in good repair uh, if we have to make this relationship work. Ultimately, though, I'm optimistic for one reason that the challenges posed by China are so significant and are unlikely to disappear anytime soon, that it will give us enough uh, you know, potential energy, as it were, in the relationship uh, that can be translated kinetically to some, you know, to some good outcomes. Uh, in, in many ways, in that sense, you know, China provides uh, sufficient glue uh, to keep us going. And the way Xi Jinping China, China, Xi Jinping's China is going, you know, I don't see that glue disappearing anytime soon. My guest on the show this week is Ashley J. Tellis. Ashley holds the Tata Chair for Strategic Affairs and is a senior fellow at Carnegie. I think he has proved while he's uh, considered one of the most, if not the most insightful uh, scholars and experts on the U.S.-India relationship. Ashley, on the eve of a prime ministerial visit, I know you're in high demand. So thanks so much for sparing the time. It's always great to talk to you. Pleasure. Thank you, Malik. Grant the Masha is a co-production of the Carnegie Endowment for International Peace and the Hindustan Times. This podcast is an HD Smartcast original and is available on htsmartcast.com, India's fastest growing podcasting platform. You can also find us on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Stitcher, or wherever you get your podcasts. Don't forget to rate and review. It helps others find the show more easily. For more information about the show and to find the writing we reference on this week's episode, visit our website, grantthemasha.com. Production assistance comes from Caroline Duckworth, Tim Martin is our audio engineer, and Cliff J. Pranada is our executive producer. Thanks for listening, and see you next week. This was a Hindustan Times production, brought to you by HD Smartcast. HD Smartcast.